Welcome back to Mornings. If you have ever picked up a Ben Elton book, you uh, know the successful author does not shy away from very controversial and uh, dark issues at times. He's, he's written books, novels on violence in Hollywood, celebrities, drugs, uh, reality television stars who are willing to kill to win. Well, he's got a new offering. Uh, Christmas must be coming up. It's quite confronting. It's called Blind Faith. I tell you, it paints a world where your whole life is played out in front of the camera, no privacy exists. Ben Elton joins me. Good morning, Ben. Welcome back. So lovely to be back. Thanks for having me. You really do hit on big topics, big issues of humanity. And here goes another one. Uh, give me an overview of the book. Um, well, you did such a beautiful introduction. <laughs> I, I guess it does. Uh, it, it explores a, a world set in the future, but like most satires set in the future, it's really about today, uh, in, in which we're kind of uh, giving away our privacy. I mean, uh, Orwell once wrote the greatest of all sort of future hell visions with 1984, and he imagined uh, a big brother, which was a kind of vicious, uh, tyrannical oligarch observing everyone. We've become our own big brother. We're, we are desperate to emote at all times, to broadcast our lives, to, to get on our Facebook, to get on our, our, our MySpace pages, or, or to, uh, uh, to appear on Big Brother and take our clothes off and talk about ourselves 24-7. And uh, I've just imagined a world where that's taken one step further and people begin to suspect, suspect those who actually wish to keep something private about themselves and yeah. almost see it as a perversion. What's wrong with you? What have you got to hide? Aren't you good enough to tell us what you feel all the time 24-7? I guess it's about a world where people talk before they think, and <laughs> I know a bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's for unthinking people? Uh, well, or, you, or people who don't question. Um, I mean, the book's for anybody who enjoys mm. a, a good read, obviously. But where does I'm it come from in the centre of Ben Elton? Because it's always, mm. you know, there, there's this crucial part within yourself for where these ideas mm. have flourished. Have you ever been sort of nervous of your own uh, fame, your own celebrity, mm. and nervous about? that lack of privacy? That's a, that's a very good question. I, I was, I'm fortunate to have grown up in a world just pre the, the, the modern all-encompassing technology. When I was a kid, the idea that you could carry a telephone around with you would have been an impossible dream, let alone the te a telephone which is also a movie camera, a broadcaster and a television receiver. Mm. So um, I, I personally feel you know, very comfortable with myself, but I do fear enormously and, and, uh, and worry for, for a, a generation which is now unable to avoid distraction. I don't think it's young people's fault, but if you have a, a, a telephone on which you can watch television, when are you supposed to think? When are you supposed to dream? When are you supposed to imagine? Or just simply be bored? That's when your own personality develops. And if, when you're on the bus to school, you can literally be watching last night's Australian Idol or whatever. At what point do you become yourself if at all times you are merely the subject of input from the outside? And uh, I, I, I kind of feel quite fortunate that I I grew, I, I'd sort of discovered who I was before the world became never-endingly distracting. I think it's quite a serious issue. So do you think this new generation um, using technology as much as they do is having their creativity and their free thinking and brain suppressed? I, I worry about it. I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I don't think, I'm not a Luddite, I'm not trying to smash the spinning jenny here. You can't push technology back. But I do think we need to debate with ourselves exactly how much input we do want. I mean, I'm, I, you sit in the bar, there's a television screen on. You get into a lift, there's, there's a television screen on, normally advertising something. Um, and I do think it's, it's probably fair to say that one's personality develops via reflection, via pondering, becoming, wondering who one is. And, and questioning. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you started the young ones, mm. and there was the, was it the 25th or 30th anniversary it's of the, the young ones? the 25th anniversary, 25th yeah, yeah, yeah. of the young ones. Mm. And that was free thinking, mm. radical thinking <laughs> from those times. Mm. You look back now, I mean, there's, there's the classic <laughs> shot. Do you think, uh, had technology been as uh, surrounding as it is today, you and your wouldn't have wouldn't have come up with the things we did. No, I, look, I'm, I'm essentially always an optimist. I mean, we, we've we've chatted so many times, and in the long run, it's a, it's very positive. Just you know, I feel positive just being here. Uh, and and the long run, I, I you know I think perhaps young people will find a way through, but I I, I am fearful for it. Well, what do you say to your kids? Well, like all parents, you know, I've got two eight-year-olds and a six-year-old, and you know, you get, you try and ration screen time only an hour's telly, you only have your computer at weekends, whatever. But it's difficult, and I know kids, uh, parents with teenagers who are not talking to their friends; they're they're, they're texting them, they're SMing, you know, sitting in a room having a sort of virtual, a, a, a virtual social life. 
And I think, I, I don't think the fallout has yet really been understood. The mm. technology is moving at such a pace. I mean, mm. my, my mobile doesn't take photographs. It's only five years old and people look at it. A, a, a young woman said, oh, well, a dad phone. She, saw ah. it as, she thought it was steam driven. <laughs> she thought the thing was running. I had to light a fire to, you know, to power it up. Does it make a phone call? It will make sure. a phone call. The problem is, of course, you make a phone call these days, you can't get through to anyone because it's always a, you are in a queue. <laughs> uh, so, um, look, I, I, I'm essentially an optimist, but I, I, I mean, the book, obviously, it's a, you know, it's a comedy, and it is quite a dark satire because I, I think the issues of privacy and of developing any kind of subtlety of mind are, are in question at the moment. The, the yes. constant desire to, to think before you speak. You, if you watch something like Big Brother or, or, or Australian Idol, it's not, can you sing, it's can you emote? Have you got a tragedy that you'd like to share with us? Yes. And I think the, uh, the concept of never-endingly wearing not just your heart, but your body and your soul on your sleeve for everyone to look at, yes. could eventually leave you with nowhere to go inside yourself. Yes. Um, there are a lot of uh, novelists, uh, writers in the country at the moment. I just yesterday spoke to uh, Ian Rankin Absolutely. of Rebus fame, mm. and of course Ken Follett before that, and Brian, uh, Bryce Courtney. Is this sort of some? I mean, you you have this great, <laughs> with, this with wonderful <laughs> comedy. Mm. Uh, they clearly are very different types of writers. But mm. I'm sort of looking. Can I find a common denominator in there with the brain of a writer? Um, I don't know. I don't actually hang out with a lot of writers. I actually work more with actors because as a director. But, I, but do you I, know any, an Ian Rankin or, or a Ken Follett? Uh, I, I know Ken. I've never mm -hmm. met Ian. I know Ken Follett a little bit. We used to be, be active politically back in, the, back in the day when politics was worth being active about. Um, uh, I, of course, I, I worked for many years with Richard Curtis, a very prolific mm -hmm. uh, screenwriter. Um, I think in the long run, the only thing I'd say to anyone who wants to write is uh, you don't reread your first few pages. Write enough so that there's too much of it to throw away. You know the famous image of, 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 of the writer with a typewriter and a big pile of screwed up balls? Of course, probably your, most people say, typewriter? Paper? I do it on a television screen. <laughs> but uh, don't, uh, don't, 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 don't uh, reread it until you've written enough to be fully into your story. Because for me, writing is essentially an improvisation. It's like uh, painting a picture. You never quite know whether, whether dab of paint will land until it's landed. And for me, I never quite know where my stories are going to go until I've written it. So, mm. so my advice is, uh, if at first you don't succeed, don't screw it up, just keep going. Mm. That's actually so similar, Ian Rankin said, he never knows where Rebus and what the end of the plot's going to be when he starts. Mm. So, because I was trying to get information, we have so many would-be writers, mm. every time we have authors on, I, I talk to people again, you know, I think I've got a book in me or a, a short story. So it's always valuable to get an insight. Mm. Listen, can I just say how, what a joy it is always to have you on the program, Ben. Again, congratulations. This is number 11. Where you get 12. Your... 12 I have to say my 12th it? novel. Sorry? I can't, I, I can't person. believe we missed one, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but your creativity, your musical production, the wit is, uh, is always fabulous, and, and I do thank you. Thank you very much for having me back. There you go. Blind Faith, new bestseller, Ben Elton. We